There are two passages of Scripture that I would like to examine this morning as text for the message I would like to bring. The first one is in Hebrews chapter 8 in the New Testament. And in chapter 8, as men have set those divisions in these books, we're seeing that the writer is discussing Jesus Christ and how much better he is as a better mediator, savior, etc. than what was under the law of Moses, which according to Paul was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 24. But I would have us also notice in verse 5 as he talks about the priests under the law that for, he says, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Now here is a New Testament book comprising part of the whole New Testament. And yet here is where he references a statement made by God to Moses concerning matters under the law for the children of Israel, for it was through the law they approached God. And yet it's used here in the New Testament. Uh, we do get an insight here as to how we should use the Old Testament to help us know better how to obey Christ. But the thing I want to emphasize is what is emphasized here that he was told, that is Moses, to do all things according to the pattern, pattern showed to thee in the mount. That's an objective standard, regardless of whether you're male or female, young or old, wealthy or poor, sick, healthy. That pattern is as it is. And since we have the Old Testament, we too can know that pattern as a part of that law to bring us unto Christ. But that sentiment is in the New Testament set out. Paul, in writing to the young preacher Timothy as to what he needed to be mindful of and his living a faithful life as a Christian and a preacher, but what he needed to teach all people, but especially the church, is said in 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, chapter 1, 2 Timothy 1, and verse 13. Verse 13 reads, Hold fast the form pattern in one place, form of sound, wholesome. That's what sound means there. The form of sound or wholesome words. Now, Jeff's spending time on the inspiration of the scriptures and the various uh, ideas of men and what actually inspiration means in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 in our auditorium class. Well, I assure you, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That inspiration means the form of sound words. Those are the words God, through the Holy Spirit, has given us through the writers of the Bible. They did not of themselves select those things. Now, we're admonished to hold of those words as Timothy was. Notice Paul said, as an apostle of Christ, which thou hast heard of me in faith, that's confidence, belief, and trust. And love, the love of God, the love of the things of God, the love of the brethren, which is in, not outside, but in Christ. And remember the doorway into Christ for the believer who is repentant and willing to confess his faith in Christ is to be immersed in water into Christ, Galatians 3.27. So to get in Christ, where Paul says in Ephesians 1, in verse 3, he has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Then one must be baptized into Christ as a repentant believer who has confessed his faith in Christ. But the key here in one place is pattern of sound words. Here, form of sound words. Another way of um, saying the same thing. Also, the idea is presented by Peter through the same Holy Spirit that inspired all these men. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So I say all of that to remind us that Jesus himself said, as Luke records in Luke eight eleven, that the word of God is the seed of the kingdom. When you preach the word, as Paul instructed Timothy to do, then you're sowing the seed of the kingdom. You're teaching men the will of heaven for their lives, how they're to live in the flesh on this earth. 
Now, that introduces the idea of restoring the ancient order of things. 2,000 long years have passed since the Lord established His church. You can read of it in Acts chapter 2 there in Jerusalem. How do we keep the church, the Lord's church? He purchased it with His blood, Acts 20 and 28. He built it, Matthew 16, 18, Acts chapter 2. He adds all those who are saved, who we discussed a moment ago, saved from their sins to it, Acts chapter 2, 47. And all those in it continue, now we're back to sound words, continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2, 42. So if we restore the ancient order of things, it's got to begin with words. It's got to begin with not just words, but the words of God. The words given from God by the Holy Spirit through the inspired penman of the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That's why it's called the complete or perfect law of liberty. James 1 and verse 25. Now it has been said that the major difficulty in religion today is that God's been left out of it. God has not been considered nor consulted in matters of doctrine or practice. I said last week we do a lot of talking about the Bible, the importance of the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. We should love it. We should reverence it. The will of God is presented in it. But getting right down to what does it tell David Brown to do or not to do? We don't, you don't see a lot of that. It reminds me of the little boy who came home from service. He said, Daddy couldn't go that day because he was sick. And so he said, well, what did the preacher uh, preach on? He said, he preached on sin. And he said, well, what did he have to say about it? He's again it. Well, aren't we all? But what does that mean? Sin's the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. It's doing that which is not authorized by the Scriptures, Colossians 3, 17. It's not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, 2 John 8, 9, and 10. But it gets down to specifics, doesn't it? I want to be saved by Christ. I want to be reconciled to God. I have to understand saved. And by Christ and reconciled. It gets down to defining those terms, understanding those terms, and then understanding that those terms place obligations on me whereby I show my faith in Christ and my love of God. Thus Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So teachings are advanced today that are either foreign to the teachings of Jesus are simply contrary to those found in the New Testament of Jesus Christ, or they're complete denials of the written word. God is simply left out. And where His word is not working in people, God is left out. So the writer Hosea would say, My people are destroyed because the pews weren't padded, because there was no air conditioner, because there was no PA system. Because they didn't have any modern conveniences. No, oh, my people are destroyed as they've always been destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now notice these choices. I'm going to talk about three of them. Three choices as to whom we're going to please in our words and our actions. First of all, and this is the one that gets pleased most of the time, or at least we sure work hard at it, ourselves. How many people would honestly raise your hand, and I'm not asking you to do it, if I were to ask you, how many people hate to please yourself? Let me see a show of hands. Why? You couldn't raise your hand. We all want to please ourselves. I remember an elderly lady back in Van Buren, Arkansas. She didn't have much to say about anything and would sort of grumpy. She came out, when it would come out usually, and I'd ask her these things to see what kind of remarks she would have usually. I said, how do you do today, Sister Kenshilo? And she'd say, just as I please. She was honest. Some of my brethren wouldn't have said that, but they sir sure work hard at it. Are we going to please other men? And the third is God. We please ourselves. Or other men are God. And while it must be admitted that occasionally all three may coincide to be one and the same action, more often than not they represent three different paths or choices 
We talked about choices last week. Even as they unquestionably represent three different viewpoints and principles. First, we can seek to merely please ourselves. That's what the world does. That's the big thing of the age. You know, don't judge me. Why? Well, I'm doing what I want to do. And you don't have a right to tell me that's wrong or whatever else. But, of course, they're telling me a judgment of theirs. So you can't very well operate too consistently on that because everybody does some sort of discerning. Everybody from some sort of standard or another decides this, that, or the other. They determine right or wrong. So I want to know what God thinks of it. But nevertheless, people seek merely to please themselves in so many cases. And that's what gives them pleasures and that gives them whatever it is they get out of life. Secondly, I said we could seek to please other men. Well, in this, I think we could say popular opinion or the opinion of one we're seeking to impress, that's the criteria. Help me to do whatever I can do in the morning to make my boss happy. Help me to do this. Help me to do that to please people. And again, the weaknesses of human character become the basis in word and deed. We would call these people yes men. They're going to do their best, to, especially if you're their boss, they're going to try to figure out what do I say or how do I say it or when do I say it or what do I not say so you will be happy with me. That is the motto of the henpecked husband. Thirdly, we can seek to please God. Now, that's a novel idea because some people think when they do the first two I've mentioned, they please God. But to please God, there's an objective standard. Remember what we started with? Hold fast the pattern of sound words. Referring to Moses in the Old Testament, but being applied in a New Testament book concerning Christian living today. Thus, those things are written before time. We're written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. But then directly, Paul tells a young preacher, hold fast. That means get a grip on it, don't turn loose. Don't let anybody get you loose from it. Don't let them pry their fingers from it. Hold fast, the form of sound words. Well, you can't do that unless you take the sound word themselves and learn how to st study a document to get out of it only what's been put into it by the author of it, which in the case of God, it's perfect. It's flawless. So in doing this, it's the divine wisdom of the Heavenly Father which directs our steps in performing that which is infallibly, I say infallibly right, proper, and good. That raises a question because I think some people don't believe this. Do you believe you can be infallibly right? If I do from the heart that which is infallible, then what am I? You're infallibly right. Let's show you how simple that comes down. In the great plan of salvation, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith, your confidence and trust in God and godly things, specifically as it relates to your salvation from sin. Can you know what faith is? Can you know whether you have it? Can you know when you don't? Can you know what you need to do to have it? Well, if you can't, just close the Bible and eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die because, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, yes, you can infallibly know you have faith in God. Well, is, is it a living faith that will save your soul? Well, the Bible spends a lot of time on what a living faith is over against a dead faith. Faith without works is dead. You obey Christ, that's when you work the works of him that sent you, that is, as a human, applying words of Christ to himself to do the work he came to do. Can I know what God requires of me? Yes, I can. Faith, can I repent? Well, if I repent, I have to know what I'm turning from that I know was wrong, and I know it was wrong because I read the standard. I read the book. I read the form of doctrine that I hold fast. And I know also that Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges them. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. Well, that's the truth or a lie. If it's a lie, it's about the biggest lie ever been pulled over on anybody. 
So yes, we can know those things. I think some people wish they could just wander around in the shadows because they know if they absolutely know that they know that they know it, they have obligations on their shoulders that they must discharge or they're not pleasing to God. If you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. In pleasing ourselves, it is our feelings, our desires, our opinions, our ideas, our direct action based on those things. We ask ourselves, do I like it? Do I feel it's right? And in that way then, so many times, especially in religious matters and even in the Lord's church, that's why that individual brothers and sisters of Christ get all out of sorts with one another. Because we're sitting around saying it's all got to circulate around me. And I'm going to cause trouble if it doesn't circulate around me. But let's remove it from the spiritual family of God. Bring it down to the homes in America. You know, there are less of those homes now because so many people are living outside of marriage. So many married and there are divorces and no one cares much about what the Lord said about who joins people in a scriptural marriage, Matthew 19, 6, or who has a right to dissolve a marriage, Matthew 19, 9. You've got all sorts of living anyway. People, now we're back to where we started, anyway people want to, how they desire to live. Far be it from a God in old 2,000 year old book to tell me how to live. So what we're seeing then is people in the home aren't even paying attention to God's words concerning the home. The role of husband and father, the role of wife and mother, the role of children. Does the Bible comment and have anything to say on, the, on those things? Are there specific things you must do and must not do to be a godly home? Well, indeed there is. But if you take the view that it, all that matters is pleasing yourself, there's going to be trouble in that home. In searching our own likes and dislikes, in searching how we feel pro and con on the matter, we simply are not serving God. We're serving ourselves. Selfishness becomes then the rule. What else could become the rule? If everything is judged on the basis of your opinions, your likes and dislikes, then it becomes a selfishness, a self-willed spirit. Sometimes we don't even know how those things develop in us, but we're doing things that cultivate it rather than do things to lay it aside. When if you will remember anything the Lord taught and exemplified in his living, he poured self out in service to others, to the most menial of tasks to help somebody else and did not go about seeking to do his own will. My meat or food, he said, is to do the will of my father. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And, of course, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So should we seek to serve ourselves? Are to serve God. Humanism says man's the measure of all things. And every way possible around us today. And is growing by leaps and bounds. Even while I speak. People are being taught. To do as they please. Now what's interesting about that is. Is that as it begins to move more and more. In the direction of that disposition of heart. Those that are crying out. Let us alone and let us do as we please. Begin to try to. Put the thumb screws on everybody else. And so they thwart their rights and actions to do as they please. And so that's how that dictatorial governments come into power. And that's how folks end up being under autocratic rule. Where you're going to do as I please because I will do as I please. It's all contradictory. And I can tell you who's behind it. And if you know your Bible, you know who's behind it. It's the devil. Working through his agents. Who are those agents? Men who will not receive God's word. Men who have no reverence for God. You know, that had to get into the church. How do I know that? Because you can't fall away from Christ unless you leave the word of Christ. And how much warning is said in the New Testament as it was being written by the Holy Spirit through the inspired writers. 
that we must be mindful of one thing and one thing only, being united upon a thus saith the Lord proposition and only on a thus saith the Lord proposition. In seeking to please others, it's the popular opinion which guides our deeds. We ask, what will people like? What do the people feel is right? What will give me the greatest popularity? And the next thing is, I'm running for office. <laughs> because that is the politician's idea. There's not a one of them. That's the reason that if they've been in, in some sort of political office for a long time, that if you go back and listen to them 20 years ago, and then you listen to what they're saying today on the exact same subject, they can speak right the opposite. Because they speak as they think the people want to hear. And if that's different, completely, categorically different from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, that's fine with them. And they're not bothered by that at all. And the truth of the matter is, a great many people in the populace aren't really, uh, aren't really upset about it either. Because they're telling them what they want to hear. Here, because you see, the Bible also talks about people with itching ears. And those fellows know how to scratch ears. I'm telling you, they know. And you will too if you're going to live on the idea of pleasing yourself. In seeking to please God, it is His likes. It's His dislikes. It is His will set out in the meaning of the words of the Bible as you would come to understand any literature that's written to give direction and how a person is to think and live. It's what pleases him that concerns us. Many people can't understand that because they don't live that way. If you start preaching a certain thing, let's give you for example, in the worship assembly of the saints, one of the five acts of worship is the observance of the Lord's Supper. We can go into detail about that. We we're just going to say that it was the observance of the Lord's Supper. This do in memory of me, in the memory of the death of Christ. Paul said we show forth his death till he come again. All right. Now, if you press that, that it must be, only as the New Testament authorizes, on the first day of the week. People may say, well, that's all right if you want to do it that way. But I like to do it on Saturday afternoon or Tuesday night or whatever or on Sunday and any other time I want to do it. After all, what's wrong with Christians remembering the death of Christ and using the bread and the fruit of the vine to do it? Well, first of all, aren't we here to please God? How do you know what pleases God? Just asking your neighbors? Well, Jesus did that one time. Who do men say that I am? Some say this, some say that. I always say, you've heard me say many times, you ask that question, and here's this big group called the some says that come trotting out. Sort of like the kids when you're, when you're rearing them and you hear a crash, you go in there and there's a dish broke. And uh, here's another class of people that come out. Not me's. Not me. In other words, <laughs> it just broke itself. Not me's. So you can't depend upon what people say or what they think. I don't care how sincere and religious they are. You have to go to the Bible. What was said to hold fast the pattern of sound words, the form of sound words. Make all things according to the pattern. Stay with it. Don't deviate. We have examples from the Old Testament when they did. Remember Nadab and Abihu? They did not act according to the pattern by the authority of Christ. Just they used fire that was just something God didn't authorize. And he killed them for it. Why did he do such a drastic thing? Same reason he killed Aquila, not Aquila and Priscilla, but uh, mine's gone. Tell me here. And now Sapphira. I would be smart and say Je <laughs> Jeff's rubbing off on me, but I won't do that. <laughs> okay, and now Sapphira. Why right there do you have that in your Bible? They lied about money and God killed them right there. Just read on, go on. Now you're going to pick up Tom Sawyer and read it. It never makes any impression on you. Uh, you do know who Tom Sawyer is, Mark Twain. So the point is, why, are that, why did God in his infinite wisdom put those accounts in the Bible? He doesn't tolerate any of that stuff. Now you say, well, he doesn't kill me when I lie. But you see, there is the great judgment day coming in which he will fi have a final and complete judgment upon all men in the light of the standards that govern them on this earth, whether it's Abraham and the patriarchy, 
or the Jews under the law of Moses or us under the authority of Christ. We will give an account for every deed done in the body in the light of those objective standards that are infallible because they are the form of sound words for that generation and the people that lived under it. So in seeking to please God, it's his likes and dislikes. It's his views that pleases us. But people can't see that. If you preach the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, well, look what that preacher said. Well, they never look and say, there it is in my Bible, God looking right back at me. It's just that the preacher told me about it. And you can't get to God until you get to the messenger. <laughs> That's exactly what happened to Stephen. Why do you think they killed Stephen? These are the same people that killed Jesus Christ. And they would kill anybody else. Jesus tried to tell the apostles and well told them, if they do this to me, what are they going to do to you? Get ready for that. It's going to happen if you're true to my book, if you carry out my will. If being obedient to me is more important to you than life itself, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. If losing your physical life to keep the truth of God and not deviate from it, in holding fast the pattern or form of sound words is what you must do, then do it. Because you're all going to die someday anyway. Why not die for the cause of Christ? And who do we have as an example among mere mortals? Stephen. Stephen. That's another reason that's in the Bible. Notice that Paul's attitude was, does God like it? And so we're all the faithful. Does God want it done? Does God authorize it does God command it what does God say it's his it's the recognition of the sovereignty of the father and he reveals his will in the word of God and nowhere else so the question is should we seek to serve God well it's easy so well certainly well should we seek to serve God yes but who do we really serve others or ourselves Paul said, for do I seek, or for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Galatians 1 verse 10. He's talking about a disposition of mind that governed his every thought, word, and action. He was here to serve God. Now whatever the fallout may be, then let it come. Because I'm going to serve God. Restoring the ancient order of things in religion is the result of the desire to please God in all things at all costs. It's the final rule of faith and practice, salvation from sin, faithful in the church, the purpose, the organization, the worship, and the work of the church that Jesus built and what it is to live a Christian life in that church. Wouldn't it be interesting if you just sat down, a young man is getting old enough to think on these things. He's been brought up rightly, so here, young man, we're going to study. Since you may find a girl that you want to marry, let's just start talking about where you go look for that girl, the kind of girl you're going to look to marry. Let's study her qualities. Let's study her characters. Same thing would be true regarding a young lady. Are they there in the Word of God regarding the kind of characteristics are they there in either male or female? Certainly. Well, do you know your role when you marry as a husband or wife? Do you know your role as a father? Do you know the responsibilities laid upon you if you take those things upon you? Notice that we're talking about not what you like or dislike, but the responsibilities God in his infallible word lays upon you. And so this idea of pleasing God permeates every second of every hour of every day. In all these areas, the restoration state of mind asks, does it please God? Does God want it? Does God command it? Does God authorize it? What does God say? There's the disposition of mind. Really quite simple, isn't it? And it has to do with that and nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. Restoration is searching for the ancient order of things. What God has set forth in the book divine. Learning how to rightly divide it. To ascertain the authority of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 and Colossians 3.17. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Just to be a Christian is all you want to be as the Bible defines that term. So restoration is searching for that ancient order of things. What God set forth. 
what has been revealed by God in the Bible. And then when you learn your duties to God, you do them with all of your might. And you don't care about anything else but that. And if you'll have that attitude, you'll be what you ought to be toward yourself, toward your family, toward every member of the church, toward the society. But first of all, it must be focused on God and His Word. Because He instructs us in all those areas. Obedience, then, is absolutely necessary. You just can't please God without obeying Him. I don't care what anybody else says. You cannot please God without, from the heart, obeying Him. Obedience is absolutely necessary. Now, you can know intellectually the true organization, worship, work, and doctrine as far as the church is concerned and about individual Christian living. You can know those things. You can know what the proper character is for Christians and yet never please God for one simple reason. For the knowledge is useless without the application, without compliance with the will of God without putting into practice what God said you ought to do. If you honestly wear the name Christian as it is found in the New Testament and defined, that means that you are of Christ. To be of Christ is that your life reflects it, the way you deal with things. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not Hearers only. What happens if you're not that way? Deceiving your own selves. You want to deceive yourself? You want to believe a lie, a falsehood? Well, then just know the truth, and as it applies to you, and you may quote the scriptures that shows it, but then don't do it. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, what's he like? The Holy Spirit says he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But in contrast to that, listen, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, and being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1, 21 and verses following, through 25 actually. As Jesus said, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say, Luke 6, 46. John would write to Christians in 1 John 3, 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. There's no other way you're going to be righteous but in honestly receiving and doing what the Bible says. Now listen to the words of God to Israel and the need for obedience, I think, will be clearly seen for those that want to see it. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt do that which is right in his sight and wilt give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee. He's talking about what happened down in Egypt, which I brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Exodus 15, 26. Listen again in Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Then the great prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7, 21 through 24, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices, and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, concerning burnt offering or sacrifices. But this thing I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be all the ways that I have commanded you that it may be well unto you, but they hearken not, nor incline their ear, but walked in the counsels and the imagination of, the, of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Now he's not saying the law didn't require sacrifices. What he's saying is, you're just looking at it, look what's required of me, because you don't have the disposition of mind that says, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, 
command and I will obey. If you had that disposition of mind and love God with all that you have and are, then all these things would be done from the proper motive and they would not be given up and you would tenaciously hold on to everything in its proper order and place. So although addressed to the nation of Israel under the old covenant, does it not perfectly illustrate the principle of obedience in the Israel of God, the spiritual Israel of God, under the new covenant of Jesus Christ? His is a kingdom of priests. His is a holy nation. His is a peculiar meaning of purchased people, purchased by the blood of Christ. Jesus became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. Nowhere is this need to be obedient more graphically illustrated and stated than in the word of great Samuel of the Old Testament to apostate King Saul. God had commanded Saul to utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. That is the Amalekites, 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 8. No man, no woman, no child, no baby or animal was to be left alive. Yet King Saul left King Agag and some of the animals alive and led them back to Israel. Samuel, being faithful to his God, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 17, had been instructed by God. And he went out to meet Saul coming back from that military venture. And here's what he said. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Then he said, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, and obeying, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Here is an eternal principle that nobody's going to be in heaven unless they get it and practice it. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. We don't have idols today. Do we have stubborn people today? Who because of their stubbornness they will not do what God said. Then you're just like the idolaters of old. And you know why they became idolaters regardless of what the Old Testament said. When it comes to all types of iniquity. Do we have iniquity today? Yes. Do you have it among God's people? Yes. Had it gotten so great that the church fell away from the truth? Indeed it did. And thus we're talking about restoring the ancient order of things. And you can't do that without an infallible divine pattern to go by or a blueprint. So that when you know the words of Christ and you do the words of Christ, you'll have the church of Christ. Isn't that easy? If you know the words of Christ and you do the words of Christ, you'll have the church of Christ. Let me add this, as that term is used and defined in the New Testament, Romans 16, 16. If you don't have the words of Christ, or if you have them and you don't do the words of Christ, you're not going to have the church of Christ. If you want to change the church of Christ, then know the words of Christ and don't do the words of Christ. Call yourself the church of Christ, but it won't be the church of Christ. So there's far more to being the church that is all bind for Jesus Christ, the glory of God the Father and the salvation of the souls of men than to have it out there on a sign or above the door. It means every member of the church is striving with all their might to say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Command and I will obey. For it is better to obey than to sacrifice and to pay attention or to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. I'll tell you right now, if stubbornness is going to get people to heaven, there's going to be a whole lot of folks there that, according to the Word of God, aren't going to be there. Jesus condemned the Pharisees for falsely relieving the people of obedience to the Word of God, Matthew 15, verses 1 through 9. And if teaching men not to obey God and His Word was condemned by our Lord in His day, can we safely assume that those who teach we need not obey today are acceptable in the sight of God? Does it not rather teach us that we must obey the Word of God in all things? Well, the second is a great big affirmative. The Apostle Paul wrote that when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, 
Now, this is not a script out of a movie. I know it sounds like a Star Wars or something like that. This is what's going to happen just like we're looking at one another right now. Nobody's going to miss it. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, then he's going to take vengeance on them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. I guess we could say it this way. We've been warned. Warned in words. Part of that sound doctrine, the form of which we're to grasp and never turn hold of. That word that should cause us daily to live like our King and our Savior wants us to live and expects us to live. So let's seek not to please ourselves. Let's seek not to please other men. But rather let us seek to please the sovereign of all. Our Father in heaven, through His Son Jesus Christ, of the great gospel of Christ, His power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. Let us heed the words of God and of Christ in all things, restoring the Bible as the final rule of faith and practice, the plan of salvation, the church in its place of salvation, in its organization, worship, work, and the individual lives we're to live as brothers and sisters of the family of God, which is the church. And it means the doctrine pertaining to how we live. That's the doctrine and sound words that we're to grasp and never turn loose of. That's the only way you're going to live a holy life is to do that. There is no other way but to do that. So I close with, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified, Acts 20, 32. Where do you stand before God this morning? What's your attitude toward him? What's your attitude toward life itself? Why are you in the flesh? Is it not to show God you're loving by faithful obedience to the will and you will tenaciously hold to his truth, let come what may? If it's not, what worth is life living? You, we can strive all we want to to try to gather up everything of this world. You're going to leave it all behind. It's all going to burn up. Or you can live for the Lord. He's promised you eternal life. If you're not a Christian, you must believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. Confess your faith in Him, Romans 10.10. 10, and be buried with the Lord in baptism by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of past sins. The Lord will then add you to the church, Romans 6.3 and 4, Acts 2.47, Acts 2.38, 1 Peter 3.21, and so on. The scriptures are there. They're plain. But if you never read them, if you never believe them as the Word of God, they won't help you. How do you stand before God this morning? As a faithful child of God, are you? Faithful means you're obedient to the things pertaining to discharging your obligations as members of the church. If you failed in that area, we humbly beg of you by the mercies of Christ to repent of them, come confessing them, and praying God for forgiveness. And to do so now while we stand and sing.